Man, give that team a give that praise team a hand, would you? <laughs> Today is a triumphal entry. Yes. <laughs> Today started something. Today started something for our Messiah, Rabbi Yeshua. Not too long ago, he had just prayed over Jerusalem. Oh, I wish that I could just gather them under my wings. But he is obedient, even obedient to death of a cross. Friday's coming. We call it Good Friday. <coughs> Not because of really what took place on that night, but what takes place three days later. So let me tell you something. <coughs> Resurrection Sunday is next week. Amen. And it's always a good day. Amen. But it's even a better day when we have breakfast together. <laughs> so, here's the deal. There's still a sign-up sheet I need you to, to check out, see if we need any more. Um, I'm sure we need more. We're going to need lots of help um, cleaning up and getting ready because we're going to have breakfast and we're going to have church and, and we're going to have to really get going and get this place set up. And so... Um, we just need your help. So be prepared. Breakfast starts at 8.30. Service begins at regular time at 8. I'm at 10. I don't know how we're going to do that. It's a long breakfast. Um, but we'll be doing that. And also, um, we're going to need some help with in a few areas. Parking is number one. Because... The Lord needs to multiply the parking lot like he did the loaves and fishes. <laughs> but uh, we need some people to help Randall. If you'd like to help him park people, because we're going to have to get him in tight and, and whatever. And, and, and you know how we do. We have a system. We, when the big Sundays, we park everybody this way, and we all come in one way. So if you could help see Randall, um, he will he'll get you lined out on what we need to do. And then also, we need some extra help with hospitality. We're going to have a lot of people coming in that probably have never come before. And and they need to see the lighthouse smiling faces and they need to experience not you know here's the thing we know that we're a pretty friendly group but the difference between knowing and experience knowing and they need to experience what kind of family this is it's not something we just say it's something we do we do something hashtag do something that's what we want to do so we need your help there. Also, we still need candy. Here's the deal. You can bring candy. If, if we need it before Sunday, if you can talk to me, um, email me, Facebook me, or whatever, or, or even Paula. One day this week when I'm down here, you can drop off candy or whatever. But we also need candy for the soup kitchen, okay? And so I'm going to make sure that they get that this week. So just, we need some candy, all right? What do we need? Candy. Awesome deal. Um, we... Yeah, when do we need it? Right now. Now? Yeah. Now. Right, so bring it. All right. Now, what? Give a donation to Paula and she'll buy some more candy? Um, I could talk to her about that, but you can bring a donation and we'll buy some candy. Okay. Boy. Is that good? Friday good. Friday noonish? Okay. Sounds good. Um, sounds good. All right. Um, also, uh, I know this seems really early, but we're getting ready to, re to, uh, to recognize our graduates. So what I need you to do is start emailing me, Facebooking me, whatever you can do to get a hold of me or one of the keepers. If you have an eighth grader graduating, if you have a high school student graduating, if you have a college, if you know of a college student, if you're a college student and you're graduating, if you're in graduate school and you're graduate, we just want to recognize you. Uh, we'll ra recognize you in the bulletin. And then normally what we do is is uh, we like to give we like to give presents to the high school guys graduating because that's that's you know it's a big deal. They're walking into something that <laughs> they're walking into life. 
and they're going to realize that there is life after high school. <laughs> She's like, no! Anyway, so that's cool. So we got that going on. Hey, Callaway Community Choir will be here, and they will be performing Greatly to be praised on the first. This is not a joke. This is for real. They're going to be here. At, uh, doors open at 6.30. Uh, it's a free concert come of that. There's also a lot of stuff in there. Okay, that's done. Um, grab your Bible and turn to uh, 2 Corinthians. Yo. Oh, I'm so sorry. I even wrote it on the top. Women's Bible study. What? What day do you have that in there? The first. Uh, May. Oh, it's May. Yeah. Not April. No. Yeah. You're not going to be ready by then? No, that's like Wednesday. Oh. <laughs> huh. Okay. Don't, well, you can show up on the first. That'd be fine. It's still not a joke. It's still on the first. But it's May 1st. But it's May 1st. That's right. Okay. Good. Ladies Bible study starts. The, the new series starts the Monday after Resurrection Sunday. It is called Brave. It's a six-week study, if I, if I remember. Seven-week study. Starts at 6.30. Don't miss it, ladies. There's a workbook back there. You can, you can thumb through it and see, see what you're going to see. It's, it, it's, it's not quite as intense as a Beth Moore study, I believe. Um, but I think, I think you're going to enjoy it. So I know the men are scared now. They said, oh, great. All we need is women more brave. Great. That's what we need. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's the thing. It's funny how God puts things together. It's funny how, how timing works out really well. Um, as I've been looking at this, last week we, we began a discussion on the battlefields that we face, the spiritual battle where it's raging. And the first one we talked about is the battle for our mind. We looked at what, what the things that we think about in the midst of our spiritual battle. We realized that we have been given weapons. But with the weapons that come with this, we have to realize they're not of this world. World. We have to realize that we don't handle them the same way we do stuff on earth. The other thing we have to understand is what they're for. They are for demolishing strongholds. They are for demolishing arguments and high-minding thinking that raises up against the knowledge of who God is. And it's designed to help us take every thought captive and make it obedient unto Christ. And, and we learn that. But we also learn that another battlefield is the battlefield for our authority. Where our authority comes from. That we are children of God. That we are grafted in. That we have the authority. It doesn't come from anything that we can really boast about. And it cannot be measured with our worldly stuff. Because again, it goes back to the weapons. They're not of this world. And we talked about that. As I begin to look into this one, I found out that there is another battlefield that is raging in the lives of his children. And it's in a word that we're all love to hear. It's called suffering. <laughs> suffering. You see, because I guess, and maybe it's me, and I'm learning this too, but I don't know if we understand what suffering really is. And, and what he talks about. And so, Paul gets into this letter, and I'm going to tell you that one of the reasons I love Paul in the Bible is because he's very sarcastic. And today, he gets a little sarcastic. And I've been trying to figure out how I'm going to start this thing out. How am I, how am I going to do this? Because, you see, he's not playing no game. I don't know what that was about. He's not playing a game. It's so funny because I think there's a lot of us, listen to this, who treat our relationship like a game. You see, if, if I play the rules right, I can win. If, if I play the rules right, I can win. If, if I do what he says, then I'm going to be blessed by it. Yeah. Oh, I missed. Glad I missed. That would have not worked well. <laughs> If 
If I do the right things, if, if I say the right things, if I do it because I've got to, I got to do it because, because the, the, I got to do it because of obligation. Huh. And you know how I can tell when I'm not doing it right? Is when I'm suffering. That's usually how we play the game. But Paul has a totally different understanding of this. So what I want to do, if you, if you don't mind, I want to give you a story. I was going to do this at the end of it, but I think it's going to fit better at the beginning. And I want to give you a story. So what I want to do is, is I want to talk to you. This is a story that you would probably get from a motivational speaker at a business conference, okay? But I'm going to turn it around on you. And, but I want you to listen to the story because I think we're going to find out what Paul's doing here. So let me set it up for you. This is a while ago, and it's a, a medium-sized company. It's a company that's too big to be small and too small to be big. You know what I'm saying? And they're sitting there, and they've had a banner year. And it's the end of the year, and they, I mean, it's the best year they've ever had. And the employees are, man, they are excited because they know the better off the company is, the better off they are. And they're excited about it. But just like in every company, there's a boss, the CEO. And this boss, on this day that they announce all this stuff, that's, all this great stuff that's going on, he's in his office, sitting at his desk running over the numbers, looking at everything, because, see, he realizes something that the employees don't know. He realized that all the money the company had was dumped into it in the last quarter so that they could show it's their best year ever, and if they don't work twice as hard or three times as hard in the next three months, the, the business is going to shut down. So, see, on paper, it looks great. <coughs> The employees don't know that. He's got a couple employees that are kind of, we'll say, mid-management. And these two employees um, are, are the type <clears throat> that like to get recognized for hard work that they don't do. <laughs> you know, they, they, they like to have a team under them so that when it works out, they can step in and take all the credit, even though it's the team that actually did the work. And so this company, they're sitting out there, and he's in there, and next thing he hears is cheers going up in the office. And he's just like, what is going on? They're having a party. They don't, really, they don't know what I know. They're having a party. The more they the celebrate, the madder he gets. He doesn't understand it. Well, finally, there comes this really timid knock at the door. He says, come on in. It's his secretary. Very nervous. And says, hey, you know what? I think it would do them really good if you would come out and at least make an appearance. We've had a banner year. He looks up, but you don't know what I know. We got to work. She goes, no, I do know. I see the reports. But they need to know that you're behind them. And so you need to, you need to go out there. He goes, I do not want to go out there. Well, finally, as a good secretary does, talks to Boston to doing what he needs to do. And so he goes out there. And he sits on the sidelines. And he's watching this party. And in this, for some reason, these two middle-level managers thought, you know, it'd be really great if we played a game together. And so they started bobbing for apples. But it wasn't just apples. They had pears in there because, you know, it's easy for a pear because the pear kind of floats and you get the top and you can just grab it. Then they had the apple, which is a little hard to get. But what they did is they threw coins down in the bottom of the barrel. The, really, the object was to go for the money. But man, if you do that, you might drown. <laughs> and so that was the party game, and that's what they were doing. And, and so, you know, the, the boss is shaking his head in disbelief that instead of working, this is what we're doing. <coughs> Finally, the two middle management looks over there, and they see the boss. And they thought, the boss needs to play. <laughs> So they begin to chant his name, and they get the crowd going, and, and they're in there. Now, come on, you need to play, and, and whatever. And he's fighting everything within him, and all of a sudden, he gets it. So he slowly takes off his jacket. As he slowly takes off his jacket, the crowd erupts because the boss is getting into the game. 
As he walks towards the barrel, he remembers a trick when he was a youngster when they used to play this game. So he gets down and he assumes the position and he slams his head into the bucket. And he's down there, not very long, but when he pops up, his mouth is closed and when he smiles, he has a coin in his mouth. Everybody cheers. He takes the coin out and he looks at everybody and he says, all right, you see, I can play a fool. But let me tell you this, I know how to find money, even at the bottom of a bucket of water. And you lads obviously don't. If you want to find coins in your pocket, you'd better watch what I do over the next week or two. Otherwise, you're going to drown at the bottom of the tub. After all, and he looks straight at the two middle management people, you're prepared to put up with people telling you to do silly things. How about putting up with me telling you how to make this company a roaring success? And with that, he put on his coat and he walked back upstairs and he sat down at his desk. Now let me... That's a business story. And, and if you're in a business class, you know, okay, yeah, you know, you can start making some correlations on, on how to be more profitable in your business and what you do. But see, this is kind of what Paul's doing. Because see, Paul is understanding what's happening at this church. He starts out in 11, he goes, I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me, he says. He goes, you know what, you're going to put up with some. And now the sarcasm begins to flow. Just like this boss, he, he understands that he has got to talk to them just like he needs to. So let's read 1 through 6, he goes, I wish you would put up with this a little foolishness from me. Yes, do put up with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present um, to present a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from the complete uh, from the complete and pure devotion to Christ. For if I, a person, comes and preaches another Jesus whom we did not preach, you received a different spirit of which you did not receive, or a different gospel which you had not accepted. You put up with it splendid. Now, I consider myself in no way inferior to the super apostles, though untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Indeed, we have always made it clear to you in everything. Paul is getting down to what's really going on and what's really the, the crux of this passage of Scripture. And what he's been trying to tell him for so long and as he's trying to tell the main message what is this main message that he's trying to get across he's really trying to tell him look you have let the world get into the church and it subdued you to the point of foolishness you're acting just like the world and he says well, this has got to stop and so he uses two very important things as Paul being a Jewish man and his understanding of who he is and what he knows, he uses two things that's very important in the Jewish understanding. First is the concept of the marriage, of the husband and wife. Now notice how he says this. He says, I am jealous over you. With a godly jealousy because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a, a pure virgin to Christ. He said, the whole reason why I came and I preached to you was so that you would understand who Messiah is. And that you would understand who Jesus is. That you would get it. That you would understand. He's like a husband waiting. And, and this is the thing. He looks at this and he says, wow, are you getting it? <clears throat> you know, we think about it now, and even in our day, cheating on your spouse is wrong. Right? 
I don't know how long it's going to be that way in our society. Sadly enough. He says, look, we know this is wrong. But let me ask you this. You see, we're in the same position as the Corinth church. We have been set aside, the Bible says, sanctified. We've been set apart, and we have been grafted into the bride of Messiah, of Jesus. One day, our bride, groom, is coming to take us. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like, and we can argue about that. That's not the point. The point that I know is that he is coming for me and for you. And he's going to set up a kingdom on this earth that will be unbelievable. And he's coming. And listen, we are, we are here. But how many times are we guilty of cheating on him? What does that look like? Because that's some strong language, isn't it? What does that look like? Anytime we think we know better and we go our own way. Anytime we refuse to listen to him trying to draw us closer. Anytime we put ourselves above anybody else. Anytime we stop looking at those that he looked at and he commanded us to take care of. This is not the only time that Paul talks this way. In Romans 7, verse 4, he says, Therefore, my brothers, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the crucified body of Messiah, so that you may belong to one another. That right there is marriage language. That you belong to one another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we may bear fruit for God. And what about in Ephesians? When Paul pins how husbands and wives are supposed to have relationship between each other, and he starts in 21 by says, submitting to one another with love in Christ. Although we don't like to really put that verse with what it, where it needs to go. But I want you to go down because see what he's talking about. He goes, husbands, love your wives is in verse 25. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. He did this to present to him church, to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless in the same way husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church since we are members of his body and for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh this mystery is profound but what I'm talking about is Christ and the church he wants to be one flesh with us To sum up, each of you to love his wife as himself and his wife to respect her husband. Another thing Paul uses in this passage is Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> we know that as the fall of man. And most everywhere else it seems like Paul, when he talks about the fall, he looks at Adam and says, Adam is the issue. <laughs> But here he doesn't. Here he, he looks and he, and he really says more about Eve. He says, but I fear that as a serpent divided Eve by his cunning, your minds have been seduced from a complete and pure devotion to Christ. Church, he is talking to his people. We have been seduced to think that, that some of these things of the world are more important than what God has put down. Amen. We have been seduced to treat the church like a business and not a body of Christ. You see, what Paul is here... Oh, this is good. 
What Paul is concerned about, listen to this. What Paul is concerned about, that his church, now hang on with me, okay? Paul's concerned about his church having a second fall. What do I mean by that? What? What has Paul used before to talk about this relationship? 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us something. It talks about a new creation. That when Messiah had come and he had gone through with what he was doing and he had sacrificed himself on that Friday or whatever day it is, when he sacrificed himself for us and then he went to the cross and died, it was for that there would be a new creation that spread through this world like wildfire. And that is a church that is empowered by the resurrection of Jesus. You see, that's the whole point is new cre new creation it's baptism death raised to life church we are supposed to be different we have to cast off the old things because the new things are coming through the new things of who Jesus wants us to be Galatians 6 15 says it this way for both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing what matters instead is a new creation good friday the triumphal entry what happened on those days was all about a new creation that god was starting here <clears throat> But Paul seems to be hitting on something that there is a different thing being taught. And he begins to attack false teachers. He begins to, to say, look, and I want you to know that Paul isn't talking about a different style of worship. He's not talking about the use of technology in the church. He's not talking about, um, um, he's not highlighting, uh, highlighting practices of different kinds of spirituality or gifts. He's not highlighting social division. What he is actually looking at as we're going to read on, we're going to find out that what he's saying is, is you want to measure up to something, remember last week? Then you need to measure up to what Christ did and that was suffer. You need to measure up to what it is. I want you to know historical fact, Jesus went to the cross. He was brutalized for us. The Bible says he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. It was for us that he did this. He suffered. But there's more suffering that he did that we don't think about. He left his father in heaven and he took on the sins of the world to where the weight of the world was on him. Romans 8. And you knew we were going to get to Romans 8. Sorry. It's one of the best passages in the Bible. So not only do we understand that Jesus suffered, but I'm going to tell you what right now. The Bible teaches that the Spirit is also suffering. Now let me read this to you from 18. I'm just going to read it. You follow me up there in your Bibles. It says, For I consider that the suffering at this present time is not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits and anticipates for God's Son to be revealed. For the creation was subject to futility not willingly but because of him who subject it in the hope that a creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children that's us for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now and not only that 
But we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Not in this hope were we saved. Now in this hope we were saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what is he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help our weakness because we do not know what to pray for, how we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings that he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There's groaning going on. And what about God the Father? Do you not think that he weeps and groans for his people? Now I know and I believe that Elohim knows the ending. So his groaning and his weeping, his heartbreaking is out of pure love for us, not for the result. The result has been done. Matter of fact, I believe it was on the cross that Jesus said, it is finished. So what is the response of the bride going to be to this Messiah? Is she going to go after other teachings or is she going to sit where she is and be faithful to the Messiah, the suffering Messiah, the crucified and risen Messiah, the Messiah who's dying and raises is being lived out in Paul's own ministry, what he's writing about. But let me tell you something, it should be and should be living out in the ministry and in the lives of his people. How are we, his bride, responding to this? What are we going to do when people come in and offer to tickle our ears? Because it's going to happen. Do you believe that happens in the church today? It happens through man-made doctrines. It happens through legalism. It happens through bitterness and bigotry. Because it seems like all those make us feel like we're in control and therefore if we're in control we feel better about ourselves. <laughs> Back to Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7. He, he goes on to say, Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you may be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God for you free of charge. I robbed other churches by taking pay from them to minister to you. When I was present with you and, I, and in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. I have kept myself and will keep myself from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, the boasting of mine is not, will not be stopped in the, re, in the regions of Acacia. Why? Because I don't love you. Because I don't, because I don't love you. God knows I do. But I will continue to do what I am doing in order to deny the opportunity of those who want an opportunity to be regarded just as our equals in what they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no great thing if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their destinies will be according to their works. Whew. 
at this point, Paul is saying, you know what? In all this that's going on, in all the things, because of the problems in the church, there were people coming up and they were beginning to backbite and stab Paul in the back. He's established the church and now other people are coming in and Paul is suffering because of it. How many people understand what suffering is because of people's words? And see, this is what's going on. But Paul says, I am not going to take that to heart to where I will live outside of righteousness. No, Paul is saying in this, I will live above reproach. I will understand what the suffering is that Jesus went for me. Because if I understand that, then my suffering seems like nothing. He was being falsely accused. But what he did was, I mean, they were saying, well, he won't even let us tell the church thing. He won't even let us help him. And he goes, that's right. But my motives is pure. Because I don't want to burden you. And I think also God spoke into Paul's, now it doesn't say this here, so I'm taking a little liberty, okay? But if you understand the story, he's saying, besides, if I let you do this, Oh, you're going to think that you can control me and what I say because you've helped me. Oh, how many times does that happen? How many times do we each fall into that? You know, oh, I need to stand up and tell the truth, but, you know, they've been real nice to me and I don't want to lose their friendship, even though I need to tell the truth in love. Now, some of us don't have a problem with that because we don't do the in love part. We just say, here's the truth. I don't care how you feel. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you. And that's how it is. <laughs> but Paul's not trying to do this. He goes, you know I love you. God testifies of my love for you. I don't want to burden you. I don't want to do any of that kind of thing. I just want to give you the gospel free of charge. I want to tell you the good news. He wants to give the message with no strings attached. Church, we better listen. I think most churches give thing, give the gospel out on a fishing line. I helped you. So now you come in here. <laughs> Church, with any opportunity we have to give the good news of the gospel, it should be free. No strings attached. To tell the truth is to tell the truth. You know, you find someone at the store, and you invite them to church is awesome. But let's not guilt them into it. Let's just say, hey, if you're ever in, in the neighborhood, and you ever want to be moved by the Spirit, and you want to hear the truth, come to church. Whether it's the Lighthouse Church, or any other churches, as long as the gospel's being preached. But I think so many of us have become, or want to be, super apostles. I love how the Holman puts it. They were boasting about some stuff. They were comparing themselves to Paul. They were doing all this stuff. And what does and what is Paul say? Hey, you know what? Their work is going to tell the truth. He says their work are going to show their false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising them as apostles of Christ. Every time I'm thinking about this scripture, I go back to last week and the last verse that I read that really kind of floored me that, that we're ready to, we're ready to, to punish the, the disobedience only once the obedience is confirmed. You know, and I'm wondering, you know what, church? God's the one who's got to sort it all out. All we can do is be faithfully obedient to who he is and what he wants me to do and the Holy Spirit will do the job. I want to read a quote, and it's not an easy quote to read, but I'm going to ask you that you know my heart. The history of the church shows that often when the people of the church have done truly diabolical things, whether it's genocide 
or child abuse. The church has failed to name these as what they are. And that often enough, people that have been only too ready to accuse one another of being in league with Satan when what was really going on was a political power game. The generous hearted liberal who hates to say that anyone at all is wrong can, be, can easily fail to spot real evil. But the narrow minded conservative who hates to say that anyone else is right can easily label good as evil. We should not mistake Paul in this letter for the latter. He is, in, he is involved in a battle for the gospel. Would the message of Jesus be turned into a local variation on the prevailing philosophy and religious culture, or would it remain the agent of God's new creation? Maybe we, as a church, maybe we need to stop and say, why are we doing church? Are we doing this thing because we want a pat on the back or, that, or, or is it all about us? Or are we doing this thing so that God's kingdom will explode in new creation all over the county for Jesus Christ? You see, oh, I wonder if we've been doing it wrong. Because see, it's not about this building. It's not about our connection class. It's not about more than a song. It's not about what we do here at all. What we do here is only a minuscule little thing of what God is doing in the grand scheme of things. Because what God is doing is he's taking the old things and he's replacing it with a new creation. And let me tell you something. This new creation that he is providing is on fire for God. And this new creation are going to do great and mighty things. Because Jesus said, I got to go. I got to go because I got to send you the spirit. And when the spirit comes on you, Woo! Watch out! Because greater things are you going to do. Yes. Paul goes on to say this. Oh, you want to talk about some tongue-in-cheek stuff going on here? I'm just going to read it to you. And I'm going to end with a story. Oh, are you ready? He says this. I repeat, no one should consider me a fool. But if you do, at least accept me as a fool so that I may too boast a little. Did you just see what he did there? He said, you boast and you're a fool. That's what he said. He goes, and I'm going to prove it to you. <laughs> oh, man, Paul's, Paul's harsh. Okay. He says, what I say in, in this matter of boasting, I don't speak as the Lord would, but foolishly. Since many boast in an unspiritual way, I will also boast. For you being so wise, gladly put up with fools. In fact, you put up with it if someone enslaves you. If someone devours you. If someone captures you. If someone dominates you or if someone hits you in the face. I say this to our shame, we have been weak. But in whatsoever, but when whatever anyone dares to boast, I am ta and talking foolishly, I also dare. Listen to what he says. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So they are servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I didn't say that. That's what he said. <laughs> I'm a better one. I'm far and with far more labors, many more imprisonment, far worse beatings near death many times. Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. Once I was stoned by my enemies. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in an open sea. On frequent journeys I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in open country dangers in the sea and dangers among false brothers labor and hardship many sleepless nights hunger and thirst how often food how often without food cold and lacking clothing not to mention other things <laughs> There is a daily pressure on me to care for all my churches. 
Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. If boasting is necessary, then I will boast about my weaknesses. The God and the Father of Lord Jesus who is praised forever knows I'm not lying. And then, whew, he ends with something and you're going to scratch your head. Because I did. He says, in Damascus, the governor under King Arius guarded the city of Damascus in order to arrest me. So I was let down in the basket through the window in the wall and escaped his hands. Period. <laughs> Now, you got to understand, there's no chapter verse thing in the scripture in, in the original language. And I'm sure it says boasting is necessary. That kind of goes with this. But I just got to say this. God gave us this word. It may be lacking in some things some people say, but it's the only word that I got. And it comes from God and I will stand on his word. Amen. Amen. So what is he talking about this? He just said, I'm going to boast in my weakness. I'm going to give you a history, a history lesson. You don't mind? Not only that, I'm not only going to give you a history lesson, I'm going to give you an archaeology lesson. You don't mind that either? That stumped me. And I said, Lord... Why? Because, see, there's a whole bunch of theories about the second book of Corinthians. Some people say, oh, it's actually the third book, or the third book in a series, and we don't have the second one, so we don't know. Others say, oh, it's a whole bunch of letters smashed together. Again, I don't care. It's what I got. It's what God's told me. So it's there for a reason. And this time, this reason stopped me to say, why did he talk about the wall? Why did he talk about being let down in the basket? What is going on? So I did some research. And I found out some interesting facts on archaeology about the city of Corinth. In the city of Corinth, they have found a, an, I, don't know, I don't know what to call it, a stash, maybe. I don't know if it's a stash. Um, just a high percentage of a particular item. This item is called the Corna Mor Moralis. Translated, it means the crown of the wall. Now what this is, it's the highest honor bestowed on any one of the Roman army. What this looked like was a crown, but not a normal crown. This crown actually looked like a city wall. It had the four corners up tall. It had a wall. It had a gate, and it was given. It was the highest one because, see, in the day when we were all living in walled cities, that's a hard thing to attack. I mean, you could be a bad army and still be safe because <laughs> you got these real thick walls, right? So what they would do is they would do something called the siege the city. In other words, the, uh, the opposing army would come and they would build a camp around the city. They would not let any supplies in or out. Most of the time, those cities, the water supply was outside the city walls. <laughs> so, so here we have in Corinth, we have a high percentage of these special things. Coincidence? I think not. So I did some more. Well, how did a man receive this? During the siege, if you were the first man over the wall, you were, you were able to get this award. But you got to understand, it just sounds, well, that sounds easy, right? No, not easy at all. Because most of the time, it depended on what stage of the siege you were in. If you're at the beginning siege and you were going over the wall, you're going to die. <laughs> Period. A lot of these awards were given after the person died. But if your commander was smart, instead of, because what they would do is when they do the siege and then they say, okay, maybe they're starved, we'll check it out. They'd throw big long ladders up against the wall and they would climb the ladder. Well, if the army's up on the wall, they're pushing the guys off with the ladder. They're stabbing them. If you get over the wall, you got a sword because here's the army. So, every once in a while, I guess they'd send, oh, send that group. They're not that good. Let's see what happens. <laughs> 
But if it was later on in the siege, they'd put the ladders up. They'd climb up. And they'd step. And maybe there was a soldier or two waiting. But everybody else is weak because they haven't eaten. Disease is rampant in the city. The people that are dying, there's nowhere to put them. So it's stacking up in the street. It's disgusting. It's nasty. He comes over the wall. And he's able to fend off whoever is left. And now this soldier gets to say, I am the first one over the wall. And he would go. He'd go to his commander. And he'd say that. And his commander said, okay, but you realize what this means, right? Well, yeah, I know what it means. Okay, if it's found out that you are not, you're going to be put to death. And you're going to have to swear that Caesar is Lord of heaven and earth. Hmm. So I'm reading this. Why would Paul put this after he says, I'm going to boast about my weakness? I believe Paul's considering him being lowered down over the wall a weakness. Think about it. He just got through boasting all the stuff, right? He goes, but I'm going to boast about my weakness. I should have stood. But I was fearful. And those around me were fearful. And so they put me in a basket and they pushed me over. But I'm going to boast about that because guess what? Because I went over, because of my weakness, I am here today to write this letter to the Corinth church to say there are false teachers among you. You must stand strong in the truth. You see, each and every one of us right now, each and every one of us right now has something going on in our lives where the enemy is attacking. Let me tell you something. I believe in spiritual warfare. It is not something that we just make movies about. It is real. And, and I tell you what, sometimes I think the enemy laughs because we do make these movies about it. And when we make these movies about it, then we don't think it's real, so we don't take it as seriously as it is. But there is something going on, and I'm going to tell you this. Um, the way our church operates and, the, and our leadership and the way things work is that there is a spiritual battle going on from the top down. And there's these ripple effects. And people are spiritually being attacked. I mean, I mean the devil's showing up in, in real ingenious ways like hives. I'm just saying. Gene, Gene's one of the guys that preaches for me when I'm not here. So is, so is Jason Smithy. These guys take it. Sometimes they take the battle so I don't have to. And in my weakness, I boast. In my weakness, I boast because God has raised a standard. Amen. I don't know what you've got going on. But we need to boast in the weakness that we have to say, I can't do it by myself. That the only way that I am going to make it through this time is by clinging to the cross and suffering of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I need to know what it is. You know what? A long time ago, I've said this from the pulpit. I quit asking why me. I quit whining about suffering. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. I can whine all I want and it's still going to happen. Whining does not equal freedom. It equals annoying. <laughs> But surrender in my weakness Amen. equals freedom, equals healing, equals boasting in the Lord, Amen. not in myself. Amen. I think Paul's glad he was weak and he got over the wall, but I think there's a part of him that said, I should have stood my ground my Lord would have come for me. He would have put angels around me. He would have protected me. You know, because God did that several times in Scripture. 
There were times when people were coming to stone Jesus. I've read it. And he just said, whatever, and he just walked on through. <laughs> and they were like, why don't we believe that? Why don't we believe that if we are following him, if we are boasting in our weakness and says, Lord, I can't do that. You know what he's going to say? Number one, he's going to show up in our life. If he shows up in our life, he's going to say, do not fear, because that's what he always says first. And then he's going to say, get up. Jump out of the boat. Let's do some walking over this storm. Let me get you to the other side. Folks, this is what Resurrection Day is about. This is what Good Friday is about. It's recognizing the suffering of our Savior and to boast in my weakness because He did it all. Not me. I'm going to stumble and I'm going to fall. And I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say the wrong things. And I'm going to hurt feelings. I'm going to let myself get in the way. I might even relapse back into depression and anxiety. But that's okay. Because I made a promise that I'm going to run the ridge. Come on. And I know that I got guys and ladies and this congregation running right behind me. So when I stumble and I fall, they pick me up. I may be out front, but I know when someone falls and I guarantee you we will not leave a man or woman behind. We may have to stop on the ridge and make an about face and go laying some hands and anointing with oil, but then we are going to turn around and we're going to sprint to the top of the hill. You see, God is doing something here. It started last resurrection. You weren't here. I'm sorry. But God poured out on this body. Today, I almost wore my red stained jeans and my red stained shirt. Are we going to let him continue to do what he's doing? I still see that house painted red by the blood of Jesus. I still hear the blast of the trumpets. And I hear the walls come tumbling down. We, Lord Jesus, understand your suffering. We thank you for your suffering. Church, let's stand and let's worship together.